Well, I'm preaching to the choir, so I'm going to preach about on Christmas. So it's not a Christmas message, though. So don't miss. You won't constru, misconstrue that. Anybody here? Yeah, I'm going to talk about Christmas, but in so doing, you'll find there's a lot of principles that apply to other things too. But uh, for what it's worth, and whether this thing goes out over the internet or whatever, I don't know. But anyway, uh, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his, as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take Mary unto, uh, unto thee, Mary thy wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which is spoken of by the Lord, of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bitten him, and took him, uh, took unto him his wife, and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now that's the birthday story, or the uh, Christmas story. I'm sorry, not. Now, to me, the simplest and strongest um, scriptural point or case, or one of the strongest ones. Uh, against identifying with or participating in Christian in Christmas, and I guess you know what I'm, that uh, what I'm saying here is that that no Christian should participate in Christmas. I'm really just going to make a scriptural case for it. Uh, at Revelation 22 verses 10 till 15, and he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Again, an emphasis on work, as we've been emphasizing over the last weeks. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that... Do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. So in the most basic, fundamental, let's say, you know, binary sense, you know, binary is a numbering system where Things exist either as a one or as a zero. That's the computer world. It's a binary numbering system. Uh, values are represented by a string of either one or zero. And that's the way things are ultimately. It's the truth or it's a lie. All right, so we're going to come from that kind of fundamental mindset. Truth or lie. And you know what he said, uh, Jesus said in the New Testament somewhere in John, I don't remember the exact story, was it the woman at the well or what, one of those stories. He said, uh, for God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, these are the strongest fundamental arguments or Points of Scripture. This is an exercise of sanctification. You know, sanctification is a Bible principle. It's a precept. It's a doctrine. It's a pursuit. It's a goal. It's something that we achieve and strive towards as Christians. Sanctification means coming out of the world, being separated out of the world. It's mindset. It's practices. It's pursuits. It's ambitions. All that's in the world, the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life, it's not of the Father, it's of the world, it's the spirit of the world. You can't blend Christianity into the spirit of the world and somehow purify the spirit of the world by you going into that spirit of the world. You will not purify the spirit of the world. You will become corrupt. 
Evil communications corrupt good manners. So it's necessary for God's people to be saved out of the world. It's a lifelong perfection and pursuit of sanctification and holiness and purity. You must worship God in spirit and every act of worshiping God must be in the framework of truth. There cannot be any lie in it. And if there is some lie in it, that lie has to be either separated from or purged out. Now I understand that we walk according to what we've attained and in our ignorance we do things that are not holy, fully sanctified and not always according to the strictest uh, scriptural definitions of truth and then as we attain, as we go forward, as we follow on to know the Lord, as we feel after God, as we walk in faith, as we seek Him with all our heart, soul, mind and strength, then He adds, He illuminates us we go from glory to glory. We go from faith to faith. We, uh, and God continues to increase. And the, the, the light of God shines in our hearts more and more and more and more. As we attain to those things. But ultimately, you cannot worship God in a lie. So, actually, I don't feel like I need to convince anybody of that here in reference to Christmas. But, well, Amen. I guess there's a, be a reason why I'm, I'm saying it. And it might branch off into other things, too. Um, so, something that we learned in the Pembroke from Brother Glenn is Glenn um, expounded the spiritualization, I say, the spiritual application of the whole Christmas, I'm not, I shouldn't really call it Christmas, the whole um, <coughs> account of the birth of Jesus Christ. So this whole account that I started off with in Matthew 1, verses 18 to 25, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. Look at that whole um, scenario of the, the birth of Jesus Christ and look at it as a, a condensed allegory of God's operation in us. In other words, the significance of that chapter is that Christ, uh, in the spiritual sense, I mean, he did come actually literally, but is that Christ will be formed in us. Yeah. All right, so it's an allegory. Just like Paul said, I speak a mystery concerning, you know, about the, the marriage in the Christian church. I speak a mystery concerning Christ and the church. Christ is the bridegroom and the church is the bride. So also, this is an allegory. The birth of Jesus Christ, Mary is... The church, we are the flesh, uh, we are the body of flesh that God has in the earth, and we are going to be conceived. God is going to bring a conception in our hearts by the Holy Ghost before we're married. Now, when are we going to actually be married to Jesus Christ? I mean, you're not really married till there's a consummation, right? right. You're not really married till there's a consummation. Well, for us, as far as the church body being married to Jesus Christ, the head of the body, when is that consummation? At the second coming of Jesus Christ. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise, and we which are remain shall rise up together with him to meet the Lord in the air, and we will become actually one with the Lord forevermore. Spirit, soul, and body. Consummation, our flesh the head will be united with the body. The bridegroom will be united with the uh, bridegroom. Will be reunited with the bride. That is the consumma consummation. So in effect, we're not really married yet. We are espoused. We are espoused to become the bride of Jesus Christ. And before we're married, just like before Joseph was consummated with Mary, we're found with Christ in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. We're found with child. Christ dwells in your hearts by faith. He's in your hearts by faith. You have received the gift of the Holy Ghost. That doesn't mean you're sons yet. As many as received them, then he gave the power to become the sons of God. And also, he that bringeth up a servant delicately shall have him to become a son at length. Something like that, right? It's not ex yeah, mean yeah, yeah, yes. 
Yeah, he that delicately bringeth up his servant from a child shall have him become his son at the length. Now I know it says, Beloved, now are you the sons of God. But we're talking about the fulfillment of all things, going on to perfection, the ministry in Ephesians 4, apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers, given for the work of the ministry, for the perfecting of the saints, till we all come to the unity of the Spirit, to the knowledge of the Son of God, and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, till we achieve full sonship. And full sonship is can be described in a lot of ways, but one of the ways it's described as sonship is the son can do nothing but what he sees the father do. So when, when every response of our flesh, every mo mo motion of our flesh is a reaction, a response to what we see the spirit of the father urging us or giving us an unction to do, then we are in sonship. We are in the fullness of stature. Now, Christ dwells in your hearts by faith, but Christ in your hearts is not a complete operation of God. It just gives you the potential to go on to perfection. Jesus said it in the parable of the sowers. Some fell by the wayside. The fowls came and ate it up. Some seed, which is the word of God, you know, the seed is the word of God. Some fell on shallow earth, sprung up right away. When the sun came up, it scorched. Third, uh, thorns came up and choked the seed and it did not bring forth fruit to perfection. And then still the fourth is the seed that fell into good ground and brought forth fruit. Some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Only one quarter of the seed sown produced perfection. I have ordained you that you should bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. What happens for every branch that does not bring forth fruit? It is hewn down. And cast into the fire. To be trodden under foot of men. So don't tell me. Fruit unto, per unto perfection. Is not a vital important issue. Something that we must strive towards. And accomplish. Now and, and another. Uh, scriptural. Uh, parable is. Or uh, uh, account. Is when the man. Uh, comes. Uh, he. He. He comes in without a wedding garment on. And Jesus says to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment on? And of course the man was speechless. And so what's his, what's his outcome? Cast him into the outer darkness because you didn't have your wedding garment on. So the essence of that is he did not come to perfection he did not bring forth fruit and fruit is that performance of the righteousness of jesus christ in our mortal bodies so that the actions and the works that we do in our bodies are as a result of yielding to the holy ghost they are righteous acts they are righteous deeds you know he that doeth not righteousness is not of god he that doeth righteousness is of god all unrighteousness is sin so it's not enough to have Christ dwell in your hearts. We have to figure out how to get Christ out of your heart and burst into your flesh. So we are the church. We are the womb. We are Mary. We are the Jerusalem from above. The Bible. We are the Mount spiritual Mount Zion. We are the body of Christ. The body of Christ. It's Mary that carried the Christ child until it was formed in her. And then once it was formed in her, then the Christ child could come forth into the world. And that's the allegory that we're talking about. The Holy Ghost is in you. Now you about, about go to the story of John the Baptist and Elizabeth. And Mary greeted and, and saluted the Elizabeth. And you know what the Bible says? The babe leapt for joy in the mother's womb. Now I heard something the other day. This is fascinating. Fascinating. The first organ to develop in the fetus, in the womb, is the ear. The first organ. And they proved that that ear is functional. It can determine and detect waves hitting it. In the womb. You know, people like to 
poo-poo away abortion because the because the thing hasn't been born yet. But if you if you follow through with this allegory, we are filled with the Holy Ghost from our mother's womb. From the time we come into the church, which is our mother's womb. We are filled with the Holy Ghost from the mother's womb. And we leap for joy. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Before it's even been revealed. Before Christ has even come forth yet. Because we hear something. We hear it. We hear it. We have an ear already. Right from the womb we have an ear. Hear the word of the Lord. Faith comes by hearing. That, this is the real Christmas. If you want to call it Christmas. This is the real birth of Jesus Christ. And this is what has to be accomplished. Of course, man has turned it. Men don't know this secret. They don't know this mystery of God's will. His perfection is operation. But uh, So they turn it into a vain tradition. In vain, Jesus said, you worship me. In vain, you celebrate Christmas. In vain, you try to put my name and elements of Christianity and the nativity scene and the story of the birth of Jesus. In vain, you do all that because you do it according to the doctrines and commandments and tradition of men. Jesus said, you make void, void the word of God. And people become pacified falsely in their conscience because they feel like they have participated in something that's pseudo-spiritual or pseudo-religious. And it had some sort of honor to the Christ child and, and it, it references Almighty God. Of course, it's mixed in with a bunch of other things. So go back to the simplicity. I mean, we can talk about the depth of it, but if we forget the depth of it, you know, if we read everything that I got here that comes from the encyclopedias about the history and origins of all the aspects of Christmas, and you're not going to remember all that. I'm going to read some, and you'll understand it. Like I understand it as I read it, I understand it. But I'm not going to remember all the details. But you can always come back to the simplicity. Is Christmas the truth, or is Christmas a lie? And we've heard, we've heard a lot of people have studied it out. You know, the, the shepherds watch, were watching their flocks um, by night, and uh, as the uh, people would study that out, they know that the shepherds were doing that. It has something to do with, uh, I think, with uh, the offspring of sheep and that it happened in the fall. That when they watched their flocks by night, it had to do with something with, with being in the fall. Although it does not say explicitly. One thing we do know is that for sure, the Bible does not make any reference or designation or any, any kind of alluding to the day of Jesus Christ's birth. Yeah. Because it's not important. God did not mandate that we know the actual specific day he was born. Well, I'll tell you when he was born. Oh, he's going to be born today, this day of salvation. He's going to be born. You know, that's one way you can look at it as we spiritualize it. 25th yeah. Twenty-fifth of December. And you know, most of us know this already. I'll read a little bit about it. Uh, Saturnalia. Um, the winter solstice, the heathen um, festivals and heathen practices of summoning the earth back to the, uh, summoning the sun back to the earth again, because it's the time of year where the sun was farthest away from the earth. And there's all kinds of things that got put in there. All right, so, I don't know, I, I guess I'll kind of go back and forth. Uh, so, and, and remember, and even, uh, not just Christmas, but what about things like Halloween and Mother's Day and Father's Day and all of that? You know, Jesus uh, said, you say it is Korban, that is to say a gift, well, yeah, dedicated to the temple, whether soever mother and father may be profited by me. And then by your tradition, you make the commandment of God of none effect. For God said, honor your father and mother. But you say, oh, it is Korban, a gift to the temple, and you think you fulfilled that scripture. What's how, howsoever mother and father may be profited by me through this gift. Well, it kind of has a resemblance to Mother's Day or Father's Day, right? It's a once a, once a year tradition 
And we know that the, the world has commercialized it. It's highly motivated by the, the hope of companies making money. They market it. They merchandise it. And how many people buy their mother a bouquet of roses on Mother's Day and then don't have anything to do with her but walk away thinking, Lo, I have honored my mother because here's the gift I gave her. Whether you think that's an exact match to the Scripture or not, it has enough resemblance to prove the point. Well, similarly, Easter, Christmas, and all those things give people a sense of feeling like they're fulfilling something godly and spiritual when they're not. And it's not the truth. Without our dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Now you can love the lie, or you can make the lie, or you can love and make the lie. You could be any one of those three. What's the most world-renowned, celebrated festival of modern times that's embraced and encompasses the entire world? What season is it? Christmas. It's Christmas. There's no single other festival that's more recognized in one form or another. Even the Jews have Hanukkah, which kind of fits in there. But I'm saying, and every... Every culture may have their little different spin on it or contribution. To, but it, again, Babylon, mother of harlots, talk about a Babylonian form of worship. I mean, what's, what's going on in Christmas? Is it the Christmas tree? Is it Saint Nick? Is it Santa Claus? Is it, there's all kinds of things blended in there, all kinds of various things. It's just a mixing, melting pot of, uh, you know, what the heck are they, do they even know what they're doing with Christmas? And it has the commercial aspect too, Christmas, you know, giving gifts and all of that. So let's, okay, let's talk about the uh, Santa Claus element, the commercial element, and the, the blasphemous element of Christianity. All right, so the Bible says, Make no graven image or any likeness of anything. Thou shalt not bow down to worship them, because God is the Lord God. Who is the deity to be uh, exalted? It's God. Then all things that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. And I will not give my glory to another. And even in our generation, that even applies to men of God who have put their names on their ministries and they have been set up as idols. God isn't even going to let a man of God take his glory. So what makes us think that God could be pleased with a Christian participating in a festival where Santa is taking the glory of God? Yeah. Now this... Whole thing is inspired by Satan. First of all, just rearrange the letters ever so slightly, and you have Satan Claus. Well, that might seem corny to some people, but it's not corny to me. You have Satan Claus. And what are the attributes of Satan or Santa Claus? Where does he live? Why, well, he lives at the North Pole. What does the Bible say about God and his, his highest seat in his dominion? He's at the sides of the North. The sides, plural, of the north. The North Pole is every side is down. Every side is south from the North Pole. So that is Satan putting an imagery of, of Santa Claus as a, an idol, as a god, and putting him on the North Pole, on the sides of the north. All right, so that's one thing. And again, you may think it's a stretch. I don't, but it, it, that's one thing. And now think about all the songs that have followed through and all the elements that go with Christmas. You better not shout, you better not cry, you better not, whatever, I'm telling you. Yeah, He knows if you've been sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. Yeah. Now who's all all-knowing? Who's the all-knowing? Right. He's the only one who knows everything, who knows all men, whether they're bad, whether they're good, whether they're sleeping. See, they're ascribing the attributes of Almighty God to a lying image of Santa Claus. And of course, to make a mockery of it, they got to make him this big fat guy. So is that, is that our image, image of God? Is, is God some big fat guy up there on a throne wearing a big red suit going ho, ho, ho? Is that the truth or is that a lie? Is this simple enough yet? Whosoever loves and makes a lie... You know, Jesus said, uh, again, he said, that which is highly esteemed among men is... Okay, so that's the rule of thumb. The more popular 
The more highly esteemed it is among men, the more disgusting and abominable it is to God. And as I said, what's the most highly esteemed, universal, worldwide, celebrated holiday festival of all time, Christmas? Well, and what do you hear? You can't turn on the radio without hearing a Christmas song. A Christmas girl. You, you, you turn on the, even BBN and all these so-called Christian stations are just saturated with Christmas. Everyone who's here knows about Babylon, mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. I heard a voice saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partaker with her, and that you receive not of her plagues. This is the gravity of Christians being involved in this stuff. It's, it's not a nonchalant thing. If you involve yourself with Christmas, there's no pretense. There's no scriptural pretense. There's no humanitarian pretense by which you should involve yourself with Christmas in any way, shape, or form. You are a partaker of the sin. You receive of her plagues. Babylon, mother of harlots, as we know it, to just to very much give you the Reader's Digest condensed version, you know, 325 A.D., the Council of Nicaea, Constantine took the Roman Empire and blended it with elements of blended elements of pagan religion with the elements of Christianity to get a universal religion to control the people and so on. And that's where the Catholic Church came from. In the early church they never celebrated Christmas. In the early church they didn't even celebrate anybody's birthday historically as far as anybody knows. The only two biblical Biblical accounts of the celebration of birthdays. One was King Herod. And on that celebration, he promised the damsel and anything she wanted because she danced before Herod and pleased him. And mother says, tell Herod to give me the head of John the Baptist and the charger. So that's one birthday. Okay. Well, how come the Bible never exalts birthdays and counts, us, counts them as something to be honored and celebrated and glorified? What did, what did Jeremiah say about his What did Job say about his birthday? <laughs> Curse the day I was born. Let not that day be named and all of that. Okay, so you see there's no emphasis or inkling or suggestion, even a suggestion of, of giving a, any kind of special regard to birthday. So the one was King Herod, okay? Well, Job and Jeremiah both basically cursed their day that they were born, their birthday. But there's another account of someone celebrating a birthday. Bo both of them, yeah, here it is. Pharaoh, it was Pharaoh's birthday. Pharaoh's birthday. He made a feast to all his servants, uh, it, after which he lifted up the head of the chief butler and baker among his servants. He restored the chief butler unto his butlership again and gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, uh, Joseph had interpreted to them. Those are the only references to birthdays, and they are not in reference to Christians. Right, they're not. So, it may not be a popular thing for me to say, but there is no emphasis on birthdays. You know, it's not important, and here's another thing, getting into maybe the depth of it, is um, can a little baby Jesus, who is a crying babe, swaddling in swaddling clothes, wrapped in swaddling clothes in a manger, is he any threat to you? Can, can that, that little baby Jesus require anything of you? Now, now, he had to become a man, okay? Well, here's another thing. Behold, childhood and youth are vanity. Now, it's not vanity in that you have to go through childhood to get to adulthood. But if you isolate childhood in and of itself and separate childhood from the rest of the development of a child into a mature, responsible adult then childhood of itself is vanity if it doesn't follow through to maturity. So there is, it is completely vain to celebrate and honor the birth of Jesus Christ and give honor and regard to Him as a child if you don't follow through and consider Jesus Christ the High Priest, the Son of God, who is coming back again in flaming fire, taking vengeance. You don't have the whole story. Now, it's, again, it's not vain in this respect. It's not vain for Jesus to have become a child so that as a high priest, he could be faithful and merciful and so he could relate to us 
as we go on to perfection as He's saving us, because we had to come into the world as children, and we had to grow up, and then we had to... So Jesus had to go through everything the same as we have to go through. So He would be qualified when He became a high priest. Now the Bible never, ever said... I'm always quoting this scripture from Hebrews 3. I'm always quoting it. The Bible never said, Now consider the baby child Jesus in a manger... Jesus Christ. No, it says, consider the apostle and the high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. And I always point out why it was those two. The apostle is the one who was the mature son of God, who denied himself, picked up his cross, suffered in the flesh. Consider that. But then you might get discouraged at the prospect of all this suffering you're going to face if you follow Jesus. So don't just consider the apostle. Consider the high priest. Consider how he is glorified afterwards. Consider the relationship he has. Consider he is highly exalted. Sitting on the right hand of God. Alive forevermore. Overcame sin, flesh, and the devil. He has the keys to sin and hell and death and the grave. He's able to save you to the uttermost. And he's able to empower you. To give you everything that you need for life and godliness and suffering and persecution and glorification. He, he can give it all to you. So consider the high priest. He gives you gifts. You know, high priest. Oh, there's another blasphemy of Satan. Or a Santa Claus. Santa Claus goes all over the world giving out gifts. Right? All over the world giving out gifts. Okay, well, what's the obvious blasphemy? Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Santa Claus. You see? You see what a blasphemy it is? Now, I'm not saying men in their conscience are deliberately trying to think and, and be vigilant and, and antagonistic against God and think all this is blasphemies. But what you've got to understand is Satan does. Satan knows it's a blasphemy. It's Satan's mock at God. It's Satan's taunt at God. And no Christian ought to be a partaker of that. Once it comes, especially once it comes to your knowledge. Like I say, it's not enough just to... Uh, it, you, you can't take Christmas and Halloween and Easter and you can't involve yourself and, say, and, and try to purify it like... I'll tell you, just, just give you some examples that I've had over the years. I was talking to a girl I went to high school with and when we went to high school she wasn't saved and I wasn't saved. But afterwards she, she got saved because her dad got saved and he was uh, operating a Christian bookstore in the, in the area. And we had some issues with that because he catered to the Catholics and other things. But either way, she did have a born-again experience. And, and I was talking to her about Christmas once. I said, well, you know, Christmas is a lie. God doesn't want us to celebrate. I said, Santa doesn't exist. You don't, you don't want to tell your child that Santa Claus ex exists. I said, and then, this doesn't happen with every child, but you're setting up the potential for the child to grow up and realize, hey, Santa isn't real. Somebody lied to me, you know. You're, you're, you're setting up a potential betrayal in their heart. Now, some people are affected by that, and some aren't. But again, it's a lie. Why, why would you want to worship God according to a lie? I said, so Santa Claus is a lie. You know that. You know, there's no Santa Claus. It's not Santa Claus. And she says, oh, well, we celebrate Christmas, but I tell my kids, Mommy and Daddy are Santa Claus. <laughs> and that's somehow supposed to purify it and make it legitimate. See, so that's what I'm saying is there's no way you can legitimize it like that. You can't join it and insert and try to steer the, the motion of worship to acknowledge something Christian. It's corrupt. It's polluted. Every Christian needs to understand and seek out what is the origin, what is the root of this so-called festival. If God did not mandate it from the beginning... If he didn't, if he wasn't the source of it coming forth in the first place, then the answer to the Christian is come out of it. Get out of it. The Knights of Columbus are actually uh, linked to uh, Masons and uh, brotherhoods like that, which are a part of the Babylon Mother of Harlots. They are secret orders and they are not Christian. God never mandated them. And they, they appear to, uh, they show out in a show of good works for the community and everything else. But behind it all, if you, especially if you look at the Masons, 
you'll see that, you know, we, who is the guy? Albert Pike is his name, right? And he, he wrote the many, many books that point out how the god of the Masons is Lucifer. It's Luciferian. And Knights of Columbus is the same. Now, the Knights of Columbus have a campaign that says, Keep Christ in Christmas. Well, first of all, Chris Mass is very obviously the Mass of Christ. Mass is Catholic. The Mass is Catholic. Catholic is Babylon, Mother of Hearts. Come out of her. Phony religion. Babylonish religion. But no, you don't want to keep Christ in Christmas. You want to get him out of there. Because if you worship God or Christ, you have to worship him in spirit and in truth. And your worship of God must be sanctified, free, and clear from ungodly influences. You have to worship Him in spirit. You have to worship Him in truth. The worship has to be something God-mandated and not Satan. It cannot be blended with other elements of corruption. Okay, so, and this is what ha what's happening. Like I say, for no pretense, you think, oh, well, we should celebrate Christmas. It's a good opportunity to witness to them. No, that's a, that's a religious pretense. You Never should you take a religious pretense or some kind of pretense of out, reaching out to people or some pretense of hu humanitarianism or some pretense of, oh, it's a good family time of the year. Well, I'm all for good family times. Just get it out of Christmas. Just do it all the time. Um, I'm all for, you know, showing each other charity and uh, if, if we love one another, we can give each other a gift here or there or whatever. I'm all for that. Don't ever call it a Christmas gift. Just give it to me on uh, April the 17th or something. You know what I'm saying. Just do it because it's a motion of the heart. You can't identify it with the uh, corruption of the world because it is a foundation of Satan that is designed to distract men from true wor worship, and not only that, but to mock and blasphemy the God of heaven. What else? So I like to say, well, is, is Christmas scriptural? Well, it's, it's scriptural, but all the scripture speaks against it, right? It's not script scriptural to the point of justifying it or making it uh, legitimate or anything. Now, so, you go on the radio and you walk into the stores and everywhere you go, all you hear is all this Christmas. Everything from Rudolph the Red-Nosed Date Reindeer to uh, God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen, the First Noel, and uh, Faris Navidad, and uh, I even heard one today, it was uh, I Want a Hippopotamus for Christmas. Hmm. <laughs> and I just say, what the hell? <laughs> what is this? That's... But anyway, you see all the music? Well, here it is. Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold. The height was three score cubits and so on. We Most of us know the story. Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel sets up his great big statue. Then a herald cried all loud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. You see the pattern? Mm -hmm. Nebuchadnezzar is a type of Satan. Satan has set up this golden Santa Claus Christmas image. Whenever you start hearing the music, start thinking about Christmas. Start doing your Christmas shopping. And start getting in. Get into the Christmas spirit. Proving it is another spirit. It is a Christmas spirit. It's not the spirit of Christ. It's a Christmas spirit. Yeah. So the baby Jesus is harmless. He doesn't threaten you. The baby Jesus is not in any kind of status or, or, or position that can reckon with you. And that's why the whole world will, will honor what they think honor and acknowledge Christ is born. No, I think it's a good thing that Christ was born. Birth of Jesus Christ. When Christ was born, the multitude of the angel hosts appeared and they said, Glory to God on high, peace and Good will to men. And I firmly and totally believe that when Jesus Christ was born 2,000 years ago, God was expressing uh, a gesture of peace and good will towards men. And I believe that was what was in the heart of God 2,000 years ago when he 
Jesus Christ was first born. But if you hear me preach, and I said it last week, and I've said it other times, what have we done? What has our world done with 2,000 years of light and truth and grace and so much um, exposure to the scriptures and so much illumination of God's eternal purpose that no one else has ever had in the history of mankind? Now we are the most wicked generation on the face of the earth. We have done despite to the spirit of grace. I'm, I'm telling you that it is no longer God, God's goodwill towards men. The goodwill towards men was expressed then. There is a whole teaching of dispensations where, uh, as, this is getting kind of theological, but it starts with the age of conscience when, or innocence when Adam and Eve were innocent in the garden and then they sinned and they were conscious. There, then God let men walk according to their conscience. And then Abraham came along and he gave Abraham a promise. It was a dispensation of promise. And then came the law, right? Then there was uh, grace and the millennial kingdom and then the eternal kingdom. Anyway, there's seven dispensations. I don't, oh, yeah, I missed the human government. That's what I missed. Now, this is not really scriptural. It's getting kind of theological. But I'm going to go down here for just a minute. Uh, innocence, conscience, human government, Promise, law, grace, and then the kingdom of, of God. Seven stages to perfection of God's kingdom for a thousand years. Now, that is from the beginning of time to when Christ comes the second time. There is a pattern like that that works in every man. God, When we are first born into the world, we are alive without the law. We have a state of innocence when we're first born, right? Then we sin. Then we... Uh, we go through a stage of conscience, and then we have a, a, a stage where we go through where we're subject to a human government. Let's say our parents are the government, and they, we submit to our parents. And what I'm saying is we go through all these stages as individuals as well. Well, what I'm saying is God looks at mankind as a whole from the beginning of time to the end of the millennium, Around the fourth day, around the fourth day, he sent Jesus. That was the expression of his goodwill. That was his statement: peace on them, peace on earth, goodwill towards men. But then you have to follow through and through on that. When you do despite to the spirit of grace, then the love and the goodwill of God waxes cold, and then the world becomes earmarks for judgment and destruction. What if God, willing to show wrath and make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted for destruction? So what I'm saying is you just can't take that expression of God's goodwill, which was, was an expression of his goodwill towards men. It was his expression of peace and goodwill towards men at the time that Jesus Christ was born. It's, it it's all has to do with times and seasons. That, that was the season for that. That was a season for it. And I'm saying that we've done despite the grace. Anyway, so the, well, the thing is, is the baby, G, baby Jesus is harmless. He's not going to require anything of you. Who, who requires it of you? Who are, who are we going to stand in judgment before? We're going to stand before Jesus Christ, the almighty Son of God. Right? With power and great glory, fire in his eyes, feet like brass, eyes like fire, out of his mouth a sharp two-edged sword, that man by whom God will judge both the quick and the dead. That is a reckoning. Mm -hmm. That is why the day of the Lord, you know, woe to you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? It's a, you desire the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a day of darkness, he said, not a day of light. The day of... The day of the Lord is a day of reckoning. It's a fearful thing. There's a fearfulness in the day of the Lord. Well, do you ever hear about that in the Christmas story? You see my point? So talk about honoring the baby Jesus all you want. If you don't honor the rest of it, or if you don't look at the rest of God's plan, it doesn't do you any good. Because there's no fear of God in that. So, Satan and Santa... Yeah, he knows if you've been bad or good. The fat man Santa, huh? So it's like they always try to blaspheme God in the cartoons. They show this so this guy with a beard with glasses on, you know, down on his nose like I got mine on. And somehow God is sitting on a cloud and he's behind some kind of computer monitor. And he's running the universe off of a computer. And this is supposedly what God is. So this is all blasphemy. 
You don't want to be a partaker of blasphemy, do you? We don't want to be partakers of that. Now, whether I personally am trying to blaspheme God or not, I don't want to join in league with someone else who's blaspheming him. As soon as I find out he's a blasphemy, I'll say, adios. I'm not going to walk with you anymore. You're blaspheming my God. I can't be a partaker of that. So, here we are, found with child by the Holy Ghost before we're actually even one with Christ, the head of the body. We leap for joy, right? We leap for joy. We have a formed ear. And what did Paul say? My little children of whom I travail in birth till Christ be formed. Yeah. And as thou knowest not how the bones grow and are formed and how the child is formed in the womb, as thou knowest not. I mean, man knows some things about the formation, but they don't know the fullness. Don't tell me they do. They never will know. It is a glorious, unsearchable mystery of God. They can see some things, but not the fullness. All right. So, as you don't know how the womb is formed, how the child is formed in the womb, so thou knowest not all the ways of God. You know, my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. We don't know everything in explicit detail, but we do know the pattern. There are some things that are secret. The secret things belong to God, but the things that are revealed, the things that are revealed belong to us, to our children. So we can do them. There's things that we've been revealed. Things God has revealed to us. So Christ dwells in your hearts by faith. It's not good enough. Christ has to be dwelling in your hearts by faith. That is just the conception. Right? As we said before, Mary is the womb. Let's see. We know that all Christians are foreknown by God from the foundation of the world. God planted us in the world. That means we have some kind of substance of God in us before we even know who God is, before we're even saved. Okay, that's like the egg part, the egg part, like the woman carrying the egg. So the egg is the potential of life, but the life can't form until a seed comes and makes conception with the egg. And what is the seed? The Word of God. So the Word of God's preached. It's the seed. There's something in your heart that was in there from the beginning of God it receives the seed. It, it, it enters in. And conception is made. And then you receive the Holy Ghost. Now Christ is in your hearts. Now he has to form in your womb. Remember the Bible says, I was in prison. And you didn't visit me. And all the carnal minded people think they go down to the jail downtown and preach the gospel to guys who are in jail. And they think that's visiting Christ in prison. No, that, that is really a spiritual thing. That is a spiritual thing. Christ could be dwelling in my heart, but he can't come out into my flesh because I have all kinds of carnal bondages and uh, oppressions and things that uh, do not allow the expression of Christ to come out of my heart and into my flesh. So then I have to go through a process of crucifying the old man. And crucifixion is a slow, agonizing, painful death. The old man doesn't disappear with a snap of the finger. See, so it's a development. It's an operation. The old man is being crucified. To uh, see, There's no room for him at the end. Our flesh is the end. No room for him to come forth in our flesh. Christ can dwell in your hearts by faith all your life long. But until he forms into a maturity and he gets so, so big, he pushes himself out into your flesh and comes out into the world and he's born into your flesh. Until that happens, you have not fulfilled the purpose of God. Then you're just like the man without a wedding garment. You have to put this wedding garment on. You have to put it on. Christ has to come out of your heart. Oh, here's, here's your talent, Lord. Here's the Holy Ghost. I hid it in the earth. I hid it in my heart. It never came out into my flesh. It never, it never formed into a full-grown child that pushed its way out into the flesh. And you know what all the women know about uh, childbirth and the travail and the pain of bringing forth a child. All the imagery and symbolism is there in the Bible. Be in labor and travail to bring forth. We have to do this with a travail. That's how you know when Christ is really formed in you and he's ready to come forth and actually be manifested in your flesh. You know that because you go through great afflictions. You go through travail. You come to a, a great conflict and an agony. So that is the whole, that's the whole issue of, of, of the 
quote unquote Christmas story, Christ coming to the birth in general, and birthdays in general too. Right. For unto us a child is given, to us for unto us a son is born, unto us a child is given. So I'm not completely negating the significance of him coming forth as a child, or it wouldn't be in the Bible. But the undue emphasis of celebration and focus on it, mixed in with pagan elements, something that the world esteems more highly than anything else, which is absolute, total, utter abomination to God, is not something any Christian should partake of in any way, because you are a partaker. Yeah. Now, and you will receive the plagues. Because we all know this one. Jeremiah 10. Hear the word of the Lord. Speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith Lord, Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. Be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest. The work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers that it move not. Mm -hmm. And most people see this as fairly good fit, obvious fit to the Christmas tree. Mm -hmm. And it is. It's this, it's, this, uh, it's the uh, way of the heathen. So, yeah, the answer is not to fix it up. You know, or here's another thing. When I was in the UPC, they would have a Halloween service every year. Well, now, what's a Christian doing giving any recognition or observance to Halloween? Mm -hmm. Oh, but you don't understand, Jonathan. We send our kids out as angels. <laughs> Well, they send them out as witches and warlocks. <laughs> you see, you think you're going to clean up Halloween? <laughs> no, it's come out of her. Come out. Mm -hmm. Have nothing to do with it. Right. You're not going to clean up Halloween. You are partaker of the sin, and you receive the plague. Now, we all know, if, if where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst, right? So what about three or four or five? You know, one shall put a thousand to flight, two... 10,000. So as the gathering of the saints comes, if it comes in purity, what happens to the strength of the spirit? Isn't it, isn't it a stronger spirit? Well, I'll tell you, I don't have liberty to preach like this at the dining room table. And I don't mind, well, no, I don't mind preaching at the dining room table. or I don't mind discussing the word of God with people on a more casual level. The word of God is the word of God. I'm not, I'm not knocking. I'm just saying, if we sanctify a time... And we're all focused and sanctified and looking for and concentrating and set on hearing the word of God. Is And we're gathered together in his name. Is there not a power? Is there not a liberty? Is there not an empowerment to perform the will of God? So every person who decides to be a participator of a service like this adds strength to the service. It adds liberty and strength to the fulfillment of the will of God. So, likewise, every person that participates in, this, in Christmas in any way is adding a strength. The spirit is stronger as a result of the participation. That should be straightforward. That's why it's come out of her. Because you will be partaker. You will receive of the plague. I know I've said it a dozen times now. Maybe... <laughs> Maybe God wants it emphasized, or, or maybe, uh, maybe uh, I'm just a skipping record in my head. I don't know. But that brings us to this scripture. Behold Israel after the flesh. 1 Corinthians 10. I'm in 1 Corinthians 10, 18 to 21. Behold Israel after the flesh. Are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What say I then? Is the idol anything? Or is that which is offered in sacrifice to idols anything? Is Santa Claus anything? Okay, is a big Christmas dinner offered in honor of Christmas and Santa Claus? Is that anything? Is the idol anything? Is that which is offered in sacrifice? Is that anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils. What Christian wants to sacrifice to a devil? Is the origins of Chris, Christmas from God or are they from devils? And if they're from devils, why? If they're from God, why are they a pack of lies? 
Why do they have all of this element of blasphemy? You know, Santa Claus, he's, that's a blasphemy. Santa Claus is being put in the place of God. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice the devils and not the God, and I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. So you partaker of Christmas, who are you having fellowship with? Devils. Truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be a partaker of the Lord's table and the table of devils. You cannot. You can't serve two masters. You must come out. It must be sanctified. Must worship God in spirit and in truth. And if you can't, get out. Sanctify your worship. Or God does not receive it. You are a partaker of devils. You will receive of the plagues. That's as scriptural and simple as you can put it. There's no justification for any involvement in those things. Here's another element of it all. People say, well, I like to celebrate Christmas, and we do this in remembrance of Jesus. Right? Isn't that a good motivation? We would like to honor and remember Jesus, so we will observe this. Well, and people do lots of things that they say they do in remembrance of Jesus. Oh, I just wear this jewelry and this crucifix around my neck. Oh, I just put this bumper sticker on my car in remembrance of Jesus. And I, I take it back to a symbol. And maybe this is too fundamental for some people. I don't know. But Jesus only ever said to do one thing to remember him. Only one thing. He took the bread and he said this is my flesh this is the body of christ that i that is broken for you here eat eat this body and this is the blood of my covenant the blood which is shed for you here drink you guys drink it drink all of it he said this do in remembrance of me he didn't say paint about paint a pretty picture of what you think i look like we went through all that before because by and large most of um, most or if not all the Portraits of Jesus Christ are from man's imagination. And in a painting, in a countenance, a spirit is portrayed. And we know for the most part that the Catholic paintings of Jesus, which are by and large the most widely known images of Jesus on canvas, come from the Catholics. It's, it's that very soft, kind of, dare I say, effeminate kind of Jesus look. And it's deliberately meant, it's deliberately designed by Satan, inspired by Satan to, to, to portray him in likeness. And so it becomes another image, another Jesus, or incomplete. That's why God warned, don't make, don't make any likeness of anything in heaven or earth. Paul says, you ought not to think that the Godhead, the power of God, can be represented by art and craft and by men's device. Right? Because he came to their statue, to the unknown God. What is the image of God? What is, what is the God-ordained way to express His image? The image, Jesus Christ, the Word, the image was made flesh. He is the expressed image of the invisible God. How was it expressed? Did, did God send a, a Polaroid snapshot of His Son? Here is, here's His image. You understand? No, He sent the image to be demonstrated in flesh. And it's the same for us because this is, a, this is the Spirit of Christ. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh, in the present tense. Jesus Christ is supposed to eventually come forth in our flesh. Then Jesus Christ has been birthed. He's come to the birth. Now the birth of Jesus Christ is on this wise. Jonathan was in affliction and he uh, answered the call of God. And while he was yet in the womb of the church, he was found with Holy Ghost before he was even married to Jesus. And when he heard the preaching, he leapt for joy. At the call of God and the glory that was promised if he would pick up his cross and follow Jesus and Christ was formed in him and so on and so forth. He went through all these afflictions as Christ formed and then he went through afflictions and temptations and trials uh, and, and it got so overwhelming that, that you know, he was, there was a travail. You know, and Christ eventually came forth in his flesh and then he actually became 
Christ in the flesh, not that he became Jesus Christ. None of us are Jesus Christ himself, right? None of us are Jesus Christ himself. But we are the manifestation of God in flesh to our generation. He that is born of women arose none greater than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John, and that is because he that is least in this dispensation with the kingdom of God, which is within you, can actually be the manifested manifestation of Christ in the flesh. In the Old Testament, they did not have the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, so they could not achieve that. They could not achieve the righteousness of God in their mortal bodies. So God didn't require it of them. God winked at a lot of their ignorance. Now he commands men everywhere to repent. So you can't dress up any of this stuff and make it legitimate. So let me just read a few things about the historical origins of Christmas and some of the elements. Who invented Santa Claus? The legend of Santa Claus can be traced back to a monk named St. Nicholas, born in Turkey around 280 A.D., all right, so you see that the concept of Santa Claus did not exist in the early church of the apostles. It, wasn't, it didn't happen until 280 years later. Okay, Nicholas gave away his inherited wealth, traveled the countryside, helping the poor and sick, becoming known as the protector of children and sailors. And St. Nick entered, <coughs> first entered American culture in the 18th century in New York when Dutch families gathered to honor the anniversary of the date Death of Saint Nicholas, or Sinterklaas for short. Santa Claus was the evolution of that. Sinterklaas. It was Dutch, which is resembles it's, it's the Nordic, Northern, and Germanic, and whatever. Saint Nicholas, and then Sinterklaas, K L A A S, Sinterklaas, which became Santa Claus. In 1882, Episcopal minister Clement Clark Moore wrote a Christmas poem called An Account of a Visit from St. Nicholas, more popularly known by its first line, "'Twas the Night Before Christmas." The poem depicted Santa Claus as a jolly old man who flies from home to home on a sled driven by reindeer to deliver toys. The iconic version of Santa Claus as a jolly man in a red suit and white beard and a sack of toys was immortalized in 1881 when political cartoonist Thomas Nast drew on Moore's poem to create the image of old Saint Nick that we know today. Is that a truth or is that a lie? Saturnalia in Rome, where winters were not as harsh as in the far north, Saturnalia, a holiday in honor of Saturn, the god of agriculture, was celebrated. See, proving the point, this is proving the point of 1 Corinthians 10. You, the, what the heathen sacrificed to, they sacrificed to devils and not to God. Beginning in the week leading up to the winter solstice and continuing for a full month, Saturnalia was a hedonistic time when food and drink were plentiful and the normal Roman social order was turned upside down. For a month, slaves would become masters. Peasants were in command of the city. Businesses and schools were closed so that everyone could join in the fun. Also around the time of the winter solstice, Romans observed Juvenalia, a feast honoring the children of Rome. In addition, members of the upper classes often celebrated the birthday of Mithra, the god of the unconquerable sun, on December 25th. There's where your date comes from. It was believed that Mithra, an infant god, was born of a rock. For some Romans, Mithra's birthday was the most sacred day of the year. And of course, Jesus was not born on the 25th. In the early years of Christianity, Easter was the main holiday. The birth of Jesus was not celebrated. Easter had a, it was very close to Passover, and that's why Easter was there. I think in Acts chapter 12, the word Easter actually appears, and I did a little study on that. I'll share it some other time. But it was already the time of the unleavened bread. Yeah, it had already passed, so Easter was approaching. So Easter was approaching. And, so, Herod, was looking and Herod was looking, something. yeah, to please the Jews. Right. So people think that that word Easter should have been translated Passover because it is translated Passover in the other parts of the Bible but here because of the context that the feast of unleavened bread had already so the Passover passed had occurred. it already occurred so therefore it could not be referring to that it had to be referring to Easter all right but anyway that's how closely linked the time frames are but in no, no, nevertheless there was no uh, Christmas in the early church 
So unfortunately, the Bible does not mention the day for his birth, a fact that Puritans later pointed out in order to deny the legitimacy of the celebration. So you see, we're not the first ones to challenge the legitimacy of Christmas in the sight of God. Well, some evidence suggests that his birth may have occurred in the spring. Why would shepherds be herding in the middle of winter? That's the point I was trying to make before. I didn't make it that well, but you can read up on it. That's pretty common knowledge and pretty well widely accepted. Shepherds watching their flocks by night strongly implies a fall season. So Pope Julius I chose December 25th. It is commonly believed that the church chose this date in an effort to adopt and absorb the traditions of pagan Saturnalia festival into the celebration of Christmas. Deliberately bring the pagan element in. First called, first called the Feast of the Nativity. What do you see today? Nativity scenes. Mm -hmm. The custom spread to Egypt by 432 AD and to England by the end of the 6th century. By the end of the 8th century, the celebration of Christmas has spread all the way to Scandinavia. Today, in the Greek and Russian Orthodox churches, Christmas is celebrated 13 to 14 days <coughs> after the 25th. This is because Western churches use the Gregorian calendar. Eastern churches use the Julian calendar, which is 13 to 14 days behind the Gregorian calendar. Western and Eastern churches celebrate Epiphany or Three Kings Day, 12 days after their own respective Christmases. This is the day believed that the three wise men finally found Jesus in the manger. The Holy Christmas at the same time as traditional winter solstice festivals, church leaders increased the chances that Christmas would be popularly embraced. See, they wanted to make it popular, so they purposely timed it with the heathen solstice festivals. So, by Middle Ages, Christianity had for the most part replaced pagan religion. On Christmas, believers attended church, celebrated raucously in a drunken carnival-like atmosphere similar to today's Mardi Gras. This is your origins of Christmas, remember? Where's its roots? If its roots aren't in God, then we need to come out of it. Each year a beggar or student would be crowned Lord of Misrule. <laughs> and eager celebrants played the part of his subjects. The poor would go to the houses of the rich and demand their best food and drink. If owners failed to comply, the visitors would terrorize them with mischief. Christian became the time of the year when upper classes could repay their real or imagined debt to society by entertaining less fortunate citizens. All right, now you can go on and on about this stuff. And I'm not going to. That's just a, just a, the tip of the iceberg of all kinds of historical accounts and you know evidence, and if you want to call it evidence, of the origins of Christmas. All right, so may Christ come forth in us. May he come to the birth in us. May the birth of Jesus Christ be on this wise, that we have the Holy Ghost. We're espoused to Jesus. You know, may we labor and travail to bring forth. May he come forth. You know, part of the travail is this fight that we have with the old man and the new man, right? The old man wants to occupy the flesh and Jesus wants to occupy the flesh. Well, Jesus as a child doesn't have a whole lot, much of strength. But as he forms in us, as he grows and as he grows, right? The house of David, as we said before, the house of David or the new man in you, the new nature waxes stronger and stronger. It forms, it forms, it grows in you until... You're great. You're great with child. You're great with the Christ child, so to speak. And uh, he, he's going to push and force his way out into your flesh. And, of course, it's a painful thing, but after the travail, there's no more remembrance of the pain for, a, for the joy that a man-child has been born into the world. Christ has come forth in you. We actually see his image in your flesh. That's putting on the wedding garment. That's going on to perfection. If you don't do that, you're going to be there. And you're, Jesus will say, you know, how did you get in? Well, you, you got in, right? How did you get in? Well, you know, I said a sinner's prayer. I got baptized in the Holy Ghost. And Christ dwelt in my heart by faith. Yeah, but did you just hide him? Hide that talent? Or, or did he form in you? And did he bring to the birth? Remember even Brother Stair said a lot of the... Big ministries today are spiritual abortion clinics, aborting the formation of Christ, ministering to them to form Christ in them, and that sort of thing. All right, so that's your, that's my Christmas story for, for this year.
I'm not going to say Merry Christmas. I'm going to say, may Christ be formed in you. <laughs> All right. Praise the Lord. I'm done.